Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, I want to make sure I can, where I can stand. So I've been doing transplants since 1976. I love it, obviously. And uh, I hope to explain to you the entire immune system in the next two hours so that you can go out and at least understand the words that you're hearing and the explanations that you're trying to interpret for these people. Okay, so the first thing the first thing I'm going to talk about this uh, first hour is transplant. And I do have one question. Have you guys all been at the SCC already before? Okay, so okay, everyone has. Okay. Oh, not everyone. Okay. So there are people who have are unfamiliar with transplant and unfamiliar with immunotherapy. Okay, okay. I'm going to try and explain it. It's extremely, it's complex, but it all fits together in the end. So the first part is going to be about transplant. So what is transplant? What we're trying to do is take good, healthy immune system cells, bone marrow stem cells, they live in your bone marrow, to replace the diseased ones that these people come in for treatment. It's just that simple, taking out the old, putting in new. Okay, I, I say that it's simple, it's not simple. They were started, transplants were started, the first ones were in 1968, they were unsuccessful, but through perseverance, Dr. Thomas, E. Donald Thomas, the fellow on the left here, persevered and he won the Nobel Prize for this, um, for figuring out transplant. And last year, 50,000 transplants occurred worldwide. So it's made a lot of difference in a lot of people's lives. So what's being transplanted? You know, when you hear about a heart transplant or a liver transplant, it's really easy. You've got the heart, take the old one out, you put the new one in, and voila, you have a new pump that's working, right? Well, the, <laughs> voila. You know, and people are like really respectful. It meant a major surgery. Someone had to die. I mean, it's, it's really incredible when you think about it. Well, the immune system is also an organ. It has a function. It has form. You can't hold it in your hands, right? It's the blood system. But it consists of, its function is to hold white cells. The red cells carry blood, about 50% uh, on average for men. Platelets are small chunks of cells. They start out big cells in the bone marrow. And then the plasma that carries everything along. So you know when you bleed, you've got this stuff all over the place. But if, in a tube, when it consolidates, then you, you can actually see the plasma then. So the red cells carry oxygen keep our arteries and veins full, so that's function and form. The white cells, there are multiple different kinds of white cells, but in the immune system, they're really the big two that we are concerned about are the granulocytes, our neutrophils. Um, ANC is another word, for, is an abbreviation for that, you're gonna hear that a lot. And lymphocytes, and the lymphocytes are multiple different, two different kinds, B cells and T cells, but they work together to make the immune system function. The plasma provides volume and it carries everything along. It, plasma is also a cell and can also cause uh, cancer, which is what myeloma is. And platelets start out as big fat cells in your bone marrow, but once they leave the bone marrow, they become fragments and then that's what forms the clot. So here you go. Here's what we're looking at. Whoops, I apologize. Make sure I do this way. Okay, so this stem cell right here can grow into any, any kind of cell. And it can go into lymph lymphocyte lines. And these three cells are the cells that really we're concerned about in the immune system. Then the myeloid cell, this is what AML is, acute myelogenous leukemia, grow into these cells and these fight bacteria. They also go into red cells. They also become platelets. But these, the, this is the big three. This is what the immune system is all about. So where are they all made? It's made in your bone marrow. Now, all of our bones have bone marrow in them. The place where it's most obvious and easiest to get is the flat plate of the pelvis in the back here. But your long bones, your forehead, babies make bone marrow everywhere. Sternum, another place, they're all produced there, and then they float out when they're mature. So the hematopoietic stem cells, so you're gonna hear a bunch of different names for what stem cells are. We call them stem cell. We call it HSCT. We call them bone marrow. We call them per peripheral blood stem cells. Essentially what we want at the very end of all this is the little baby cells, those little pluripotent cells. It's another fancy word for it can do it, grow up to be any kind of blood cell, not any kind of cell, but any kind of blood cell. We can get it one of three ways. Bone marrow. We can get it from, they actually drill for it, 300 times on each side when we're going to do a bone marrow. It's done once when people go in to get their disease diagnosed. 
for some people, we, the protocol requires bone marrow. So there are some protocols, I'll get to that later, but some treatments require bone marrow, some treatments require peripheral blood stem cells. And it's also good for certain kinds of diseases. So there are, it's very complex, but we want bone marrow for some diseases and peripheral blood stem cells for others. So the peripheral blood stem cells, what happens is that you've got your bone marrow and we give growth factors, the Nupagen or Phil Graston, we give that to a donor, give that to a, a patient or a donor, either one, and then they produce lots and lots of cells and then they spill out into the blood cell, bloodstream and then we can harvest them. We can collect them on a machine that just siphons off the cells that we need. And then the UCD or unrelated, our umbilical cord blood is only used for allogeneic transplants and that's collected after babies are born. And the cord is cut and then they um, needle up the, right out of the umbilical cord and they collect the cells. And these go to, uh, public cord blood banks. Anybody who saves their stem cells for, for themselves, that is not in the general world bank. It's not available. So I'm going to give you some definitions. So the, uh, we have two different kinds of transplants, allogeneic and autologous. Autologous comes from aut Greek, auto cell. And what happens is that we take the stem cells from the patient, we give them tons of chemotherapy that kills off their bone marrow, and then we give them the cells back, and that's called a rescue. And that's, the def that's what an autologous stem cell transplant is all about. An allogeneic transplant is from someone else, not themselves. It was an invented word, as you can see. It came from 1960s. It comes from the word uh, allo, which means different, and Greek stock. And so it's, um, it's an, like I said, it's an invention word, but it means from another person. And that's what all other transplants are all about. If a kidney transplant is an allograft, heart transplant is an allograft, et cetera, et cetera. And the, but what we're doing in this kind of transplant is we're transplanting a new immune system, not a new any kind of solid organ. And it depends on what kind of transplants, why do we do these two different kinds of things? First of all, it depends uh, on what we're trying to treat. But the big thing is an out, a transplant allows us to control the disease. It allows us to give lots of chemotherapy to control the disease. <clears throat> it allows us to give radiation. And so it, you can give far more medication to kill, try and kill the uh, cancer that's in there and then try and give them back new cells so that they can grow because the the basis of all this is that stem cells are the most sensitive cell in the body to chemotherapy they're the fastest growing cell and so they are most sensitive to chemotherapy and chemotherapy is like an atom bomb it attacks it kills everything in its pathway it doesn't just attack bad cells it attacks good cells too so the limiting factor of any kind of chemotherapy is the amount the bone marrow will tolerate. So that's the, that I think is one thing that when you're seeing any of your patients on any of the floors is when they say, well, we're gonna hold your chemotherapy because your counts aren't recovering well. That's what they're talking about. They've reached that toxic limit, limit of the chemotherapy. So for transplant, it doesn't matter. We can bombard everything we wanna do. We can kill off the bone marrow, which is what we're doing. So we, because we're gonna give new stem cells back. In the allogeneic setting, so an autologous and allogeneic, but in the allogeneic setting, we can give less chemotherapy and give lots of drugs that also replace the bone marrow. So we're not doing, we're not doing a blitzkrieg. We're not killing off the bone marrow. We're stunning it and we're giving new cells. You can't do that with autologous. You have to get rid of everything. And what that allows us to do is to use the immune system to fight off the rest of the disease. And what this allows us to do is give transplants to people who aren't as healthy as the full big guns transplant. So why, do, yeah. I may have this um, obvious uh, answer for this, but why do you have to kill all the stem cells or all the uh, bone marrow when you go to autologous transplant, whereas an uh, allogenic? Why do you have to, what is the reasoning for that? That's a great question. So the question is for the taping is that why do you have to kill? It is not a why do you have to kill? It's an, it is an incidental cause of an autologous transplant. You're not aiming to kill the bone marrow. What you're doing is that you're aiming to give the most toxic doses of chemotherapy that you possibly can to kill the disease. And it just happens to kill off the bone marrow. And 
there and when uh, and I'll explain this in a little bit here is that the reason that we use high doses in autologous bone marrow is that there's no resetting of the immune system. You're just pouring one immune system back into another and it never recognized the cancer. But in an allogeneic setting, you can give less chemo, you can give, uh, we also give more chemo in the, old, in the younger people, but the new immune system recognizes the cancer. So that's one reason we can do that. And I'll, I'll explain what that is. It's called a mini transplant. Mm -hmm. So these are the different kind of diseases that you're gonna see, leukemias, lymphomas. Myelodysplastic syndrome is uh, a failure of the bone marrow to function properly. It's, it's not a leukemia, it's not a lymphoma, and it can happen in the red cell line or the platelet line. It's, uh, it is just the, that, that stem cell doesn't work properly. So the, all the other cells, leukemia and lymphomas, happen further along the um, maturation, maturation stage of the cell, but MDS is the failure of that baby cell to be normal. So that means everything is going to get messed up. Myelofibrosis is a scarring of the bone marrow, which is a really odd thing to have happen. And then we have, um, we use transplants for resetting the immune system. And that is where, uh, there are a couple of diseases called stiff person syndrome, multiple sclerosis, and then in other diseases that aren't cancer, and that's sickle cell disease as, as well. And for immune system disorders that happen, uh, genetic disorders that happen at birth. So allogeneic transplant means that you get cells from another person or another source. They are, can be matched or mismatched. They can be related, they can be peripheral blood or bone marrow. We can give cord blood, and I put this um, uh, hyperlink in there so that if you wanna look up some, have any more information about it, it's in there. And then we can use people who are totally half matched. So we can go to parent and child. You, you can't use a half mat, well, you can, but you're gonna run into problems. You can use the half matched sib, sibling, but we try not to. There's like it's like too, it, it's hard to overcome the amount of that mismatch. It's just different having a child to a parent and vice versa. And then these people stay about 120 days in Seattle after the transplant. And I just wanted to point this out to you here, the different kinds, whether it's a allogeneic is from bone marrow, peripheral blood goes to the peripheral blood and then the cord blood, just to uh, give you a little reminder. So the allogeneic transplant phases, and you guys have done here, uh, people come in, they are, they are arrived, and so you've been in those very lengthy conferences. We have a very lengthy conference the second day. They're here to sign consents, do lots of tense, testing over the course of two weeks, and that's uh, followed up by a consenting conference where the interpreter is absolutely invaluable because our goal is to have the patient understand what they're getting into. It's impossible for anybody to really understand what a transplant is like until they've gone through it and understand it, but we want them to understand the risks that they might incur. And as painful as it is to explain those to people, it's absolutely important for informed consent to be able to do that. Then once everything is, they're approved for transplant and they move on, then they go into what's the conditioning phase, and that's when they get their chemotherapy or radiation. The recovery phase is, uh, can be outpatient or inpatient, depends, and that takes about 12 to 18 days, depending on the source of marrow. Um, peripheral blood is faster, bone marrow is a little longer, or they engraft by day 21. Cord blood can take up to 40 days, so you're real susceptible to infection during that time. During that time, you're also having uh, the risk of infection, you can have transplant complications, you have a bad liver, it's gonna get worse, you have a bad heart, the chemotherapy we gave you may cause problems. And then graft versus host disease, and I'm gonna talk about that later. And then about day 100, they get to go home. I wanted to show you this to show you that we are transplanting older and older patients. So transplant, back when I started in 1976, you couldn't, you had to be less than 30 years old to have a transplant. And that didn't change much. First five years, we kind of upped it to about 35, then we went to 40, and I'll never forget our first 53-year-old patient we did for a full transplant. She was a powerhouse, she's alive, she's a powerhouse of a woman. And 
we decided she was the perfect person that was picked to be the first transplant because there's a difference between a 20 year old and a 50 year old. 20 year old has not had 50 years of experience of just getting up every day and doing what you have to do. A 50 year old has 30 years of experience of getting up every day and doing what you have to do just because you have to do it. There's no reward in it, it's just that that's what you do. And that difference in willpower is, is I think really one reason why we can transplant older people because they just know I got to do it, I'm going to do it, and I've been successful in life so far and I want to keep going. really do think that that's a great deal of difference. And then you can see we're doing um, more transplants in people over 70. There's also a trend here too is that Medicare has uh, agreed to pay for more kinds, different kinds of transplants. And that's why we're seeing more people in the 60 to 69 group as well. This just explains where people are getting their cord bloods. Now there's a limited number of siblings that one can produce. It's usually when you're 25 years old or 50 years old, it's too late to get more siblings from your parents, right? <laughs> so you have what you have. You have a, every sibling that you have, and it doesn't increase if you have 20 siblings or 10, each sibling has a 25% chance of matching. So I, we have had 11 children families and there have been no matches. They match each other, but they don't match the person who's gotten the disease, which is really unfortunate. Wow. And one really sad case where the only person who matched out of nine children, when we worked them up, also had a cancer. So you can't, you, you know, you, just because you have a large family doesn't mean you're gonna have a match. And that's where, that's where this unrelated cord, this part right here is so important. And the cord blood, it looks like it's leveling off here, but it, it really isn't. And then we're starting to do, more centers are starting to do the half, the half matches. People worry about that more because it causes more graft versus host disease. And again, this is just showing you that the cord, the percentage of cord blood is increasing. The other thing we're doing is that we're doing much less marrow than we used to. And that's because it requires special surgical care, um, not care, but uh, surgery teams. You have to have someone who's experienced in puncturing, puncturing somebody's pelvic bone 300 times on each side of the marrow, uh, each side of the hip and people aren't willing to commit that time and effort to it. There's not very many centers that do it, so they'd have to go there to learn. So peripheral blood stem cells have become much more um, popular. And the reason this has changed so much is that finally we were able to prove in 1988 that using an unrelated cord blood, unrelated uh, donor was successful. That happened here at Fred Hutch. So um, autologous and syngeneic. So you may hear those words. You're, when, you, when you get to know the areas up there, there's the auto teams and the allo teams. A syngeneic transplant is a twin transplant. And a twin transplant is identical to an autologous transplant. Because twins are you, just in duplicate. And um, the different kinds of autologous things that you, uh, not things, uh, um, Okay, I totally blanked out of what a word it could be. But what you're gonna see in an autologous transplant is you might see first a person who's gonna be a collect on arrival, so they arrive ready to get their stem cells collected. Um, you might see a patient who's coming in to get a workup like a regular transplant, and they're gonna go through the whole workup, they're gonna get their stem cells collected. That's called mobilization. And then they get their chemotherapy, and then they get their, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, they get their stem cells collected by using chemotherapy, by using Neupogen or GCSF and another drug called Mosable. They get their transplant. That recovery happens in about 30 days. But auto transplant patients can be here for six months. And one reason that that happens is they come here, they collect on arrival. We find out that they, don't, they have way too much um, tumor burden to be able to transplant them. And then we go and give them chemotherapy. And they're too, maybe they live in Montana and they don't want to go home to get their chemotherapy. Or maybe they live in Alaska and the Alaska doctor says, no, I can't do that up here. You go ahead and do it down here in Seattle. So then that poor person is stuck through round one, round two, round three, and then they finally get to go to transplant. So sometimes these, because it takes about a month to recover from each of these chemos. 
So sometimes these poor autologous patients are here way longer than the allogeneic transplants are. And then a syngeneic transplant is just basically like having an autologous transplant, except that you're not using your own stem cells, we're collecting it from an, a donor. The disadvantage for allogeneic transplants I'm sorry, for autologous transplants and syngeneic transplants is you get more relapse in it because the tumor is not, still is not recognized by the immune system. The immune system hasn't done anything to learn its job. What we've tried to do is just give massive amounts of chemotherapy to kill off what tumor we can. So you guys, uh, I just went through this here a little bit, but the collect on arrival, um, you may encounter some of those patients and you may never see them again. So just to let you know that a collect on arrival is not always does not always lead you to transplant. Some people have been advised by their physician to go ahead and collect your stem cells. We're going to see what your course of treatment takes you, and you may not need those stem cells uh, ever or in two years or in five years. Mobilization, though, if somebody's going to stay for transplant, mobilization is the means through which we get stem cells from a donor, uh, from a autologous patient. It's, it's called mobilization and allogeneic transplant as well, but it's on a donor. But what we try and do is, the goal here is to make lots of cells so they spill out into the bloodstream and we can collect them. We also give chemotherapy. Now this is much different from a normal allogeneic donor because you're not gonna give a normal person chemotherapy, obviously. You're just gonna give them a growth factor to make them make stem cells. But it's very interesting that when you're trying to collect autologous stem cells, if you give a big dose of chemotherapy, as the cells go down, the count, white count goes down, and as you rebound up, is they are just the stem cells are just pouring out of the bloodstream and you can collect in just a couple of days. It's really, it's like, whoever thought this up? I just think this is amazing. They also use uh, growth factor GCSF to speed up the process, otherwise it would take weeks to do. It's, the recovery from this can be a little unpredictable, so they might be getting, if you come in and it's day nine of getting GCSF and the nurse comes in and says, well, your white count hasn't come up enough, uh, but we think it's gonna come up in two days. They're looking at the counts and everything. So just hang in there. It takes an average of 10 days to get that person on chemotherapy and they're neutropenic this whole time as well. Um, we are also using a new drug called Polixifor Mosable. And that drug is given at night in case you're ever come evening, if you're, in case you're ever uh, asked to interpret in the evening. And that's given 12 hours before the apheresis. So it's given the night before and that really pushes the stem cells out. It, it's a very interesting drug. The whole purpose behind it is that it doesn't create more little baby stem cells. It makes them leave the bone marrow space. So the GCSF has created them all, but the mosable acts like uh, a glue washer outer. It just makes all those stem cells leave the bone marrow. And I, again, it's one of those drugs. How do you think this up? It's amazing. And then the stem cells are collected and then we can use them anytime we want. Um, stem cells can be good for 10 years. So they can, anytime in the future, they can be used. The apheresis part of the stem cell collection, the stem cell collection is collected by a process called apheresis. They're, people are hooked up to a machine. If you've, uh, I guess you could liken it to kidney dialysis, except in dialysis, you're just, the blood is going through and, chemicals are going back and forth. What's happening here is the blood comes out only about a cup at any one time. It's centrifuged. The, the stem cells lay right above the platelets and they just suck those little, stem, those little stem cells off and everything else goes back into the bloodstream. It takes about two and a half, three hours, depends. It depends on, on what, they, what kind of stem cell collection they've ordered. It's the same thing that related donors go through as well. Then they get to recover from their chemotherapy and then they, uh, the autologous patient is then evaluated for transplant. How many, uh, how much tumor burden do they have? And then they can go forward and get their chemotherapy and go forward with transplant. Recovers, recovery is about 14 days and they recover very quickly, 30 days, that's the end of auto transplant. Um, one thing that people can't, you can't encounter are what's called tandem auto transplants or double auto transplants. And so people may go through this all over again. They usually give them a little bit more grace time to recover, like two to four months, they go home and they come back again, as long as it's within six months. So you may run into the occasion where you're coming back and the patient is coming back for their second auto transplant. 
this is just to give you an idea of the different kinds of transplants that we have in the U.S. Now, these some of these, I could not find more current data on a lot of these things from 2014. They usually, the, this kind of data is put out several years post, which is unfortunate, unless you go to the fancy conferences. So this is autologous transplants right here, and this right here is where they figured out where the research studies showed that breast cancer was not treatable, was by um, autologous transplant. So boom, we stopped doing them for that. And that was a huge amount nationwide for people having autologous transplants. But then as time has gone on, we figured out a lot more uses for autologous transplant and then allo transplant just continues to rise. And that's because we have more sources of bone marrow, stem cells, and that's the peripheral blood. We're also doing older patients, as you can see, and that's making a lot of difference too. So um, it's, it's really amazing. These people can tolerate these really high doses of chemotherapy on the autologous side, they cannot tolerate it on the allogeneic side. And that's because of the other drugs. We just, you get your bone marrow and then you get your antibiotics, your stem cells recover and then you recover. But in the allogeneic side, there's so much more drug, so many more drugs that are used. It's just too hot in the bodies. So common diseases that you're gonna see, multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is a cancer of the plasma cell. And what it does is that it deposits, it, it deposits itself in the bone and it destroys the bone. And that's what multiple myeloma is. It's a big protein and so it also um, is very harmful to the kidneys as well. And then again, we use it for the inflammatory auto and autoimmune diseases. You reset the immune system and it's really amazing. Um, there are people with multiple sclerosis where they're wheelchair bound can actually recover activity. There's stiff person syndrome. Stiff person syndrome is this really odd thing where people lock up, they just, they, and they'll actually fall over. And it's an immune system, the immune system is damaged and you reset the immune system and it goes away. Amazing. Yeah. Um, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, do they do multiple sclerosis? It's not the, the, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. We, uh, the question is, does the SCCA do multiple sclerosis transplants? We don't do very many of them. You have to have very set criteria. It has to be in a very certain uh, place in your multiple, uh, your multiple sclerosis. The researcher that was dedicated to that moved to Denver, Colorado area, and they're doing some there. And we do occasional ones, but not certainly not as many as we used to. Well, I mean, multiple sclerosis is not the cancer. Multiple sclerosis is not cancer. It's an autoimmune disease. Yeah. So yeah. why do we do a transplant for it? <coughs> why this is Seattle Cancer Care? Because, because uh, it's a transplant. And the only place they can get the, tra well, not anymore, but the place they can get a transplant for multiple, it, it's treating, it's tr the treatment is why they're at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance is because we do transplants. So we're not treating a cancer, we're giving them an, a, an autologous transplant because they don't have cancer. Treating the disease. And then lymphoma is the other big thing for transplants. So just to let you little, know a little bit about transplants, uh, Seattle, um, having started transplants, they're called the Seattle Group <laughs> you go to a, a meeting. Um, they have worldwide reputation. We don't do the most transplants in the in the world or in the country, but we do the most research transplants. And that's what we do. Research R Us is the big thing. We do transplants on protocols. So a research protocol has very strict criteria to it. You have to meet certain criteria to get in. You have, there are certain criteria that can exclude you, so you can't have that kind of transplant if you don't meet those two criteria. The it's called inclusion and exclusion criteria. <clears throat> Excuse me. If people don't meet the research criteria, then they can have what's called treatment plans. And that means that we treat them, but they aren't, the, the data isn't gathered on them. So it's nice that we do the transplant for them, but it doesn't benefit the research at all. When a patient comes in for transplant, they're 
The intake department brings them in, and in the intake department, a plan of treatment is, is planned out for them. So it's not like they get here and then we scratch our heads and go, well, how are you going to treat them? Their case is already discussed in great, great detail, and a plan of treatment is made up for them. So our job when the patient comes in is to make sure they meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And if the attending physician that you're working with reviews the information and finds that this isn't the best thing for this patient, they will suggest another treatment for them. So we're not wedded to research if it's not going to benefit the patient. It has to benefit the patient. I mean, it's nice that we do research, but if the patient isn't going to benefit from it, we'll, we'll t send them out down to a different path. And then they have to be committed to at least two to four months of really intense treatment. You can have a plain autologous transplant that comes in, gets worked up, and gets home in two months. So, I mean, that does happen. We just see a lot of them. When people are planning for transplant, you have to think about this. So we ask people to live here. Now, our, most of our referrals are now coming from the Puget Sound area, but you can't live in Olympia and have a transplant. You need to move closer to Seattle. We consider local Western Washington, and now we consider it kind of Eastern Washington as well. But it, it's a daily thing. You can't live far away and, and come in. They transplant shop. People come here and say, well, I've been to Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. I've been to MD Anderson. I've been to Moffitt in Florida. What do you have to offer me? Why are you better than the rest of the place? Um, I live in Chicago. Why shouldn't I go there? And then we try and tell them why we're the best. We like to. And financials treatment, you have, it, it, transplant is not a charity treatment. Um, it is at children's. There is money for them over there, but not as an adult. You have to have a means to pay for your transplant. We have to find a donor if you're going to be an allogeneic transplant. We have demand caregivers for allogeneic transplants, some not so much for autologous. It's not very successful not to have a caregiver. So you're going to hear us talking to patients that you need a caregiver who's going to be with you 24-7 for, yeah, for four months. And I know that sounds really brutal. Well, how do you prepare for that? If you're the breadwinner and it's your spouse who's, who's sick, if you don't work, you're not going to have insurance, you're not going to have money, so you have to dig into your other relatives and your other and friends. I mean, it, it can be really, really hard on these people. You have to figure out if you are leaving your home, how are you going to take care of everybody there? You've got a 12-year-old that can come with you because we have a school. But what about your 18-year-old who's a senior in high school? They don't want to miss their last year of school. So there's, these people have a lot of pressures on them. And they have to find local housing. And as all we all know, how expensive housing is in this area. Didn't used to be this bad. Typically pre-transplant, they come for a two-week medical evaluation. They're oriented to the clinic. We have uh, two consenting conferences, one the second day they're here and one just before they go to transplant. The caregivers have to go through a lot of education. So if, they do, if English is not their first language, you're going through the education with them as well. The only patient care manuals we have are in Spanish. We don't have any other languages. They're horrendously expensive to uh, translate. Uh, but And we also do a lot of one-on-one -on -one education for people who, uh, who have interpreters. So you'll, you'll be sitting with one person doing this education where everyone else goes to a class. And then we put a central line in. So a little bit more about treatment versus research protocols. Research is done to advance care because we don't know what the best care is. Research has to be well documented. If we do not fulfill all the documentations of requirements of research, we can be shut down as a research in institution. The research protocol is the plan of treatment. The protocol is based on patient, disease, patient age disease of the patient and priority protocol. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Research is always optional. No one ever has to participate in research. Okay. It can be refused. If your patient is talking to you, you know, when we're not in the room, should I do this research? Shouldn't I? You can explain to them the reason we're doing research is we really honestly don't know what. Yeah. Actually, you shouldn't be left alone with the patient in the room, right? Right. So, ah. And you sometimes explain to the patient you should interpret. So 
Um, we just, wouldn't do that. Okay. Because we see, we, I have to tell you, we see people, you know, they, they're put in a room. Some, some interpreters sit outside, but others just, I mean, they just sit there. Sit down. Well, see, that's good information for me. I will take that back to everybody. Um, the treatment plan. Uh, anyway, we all, if someone refuses a research protocol, we can always come up with something else to do. Okay, it's not like it's not like that's the only way we'll treat a protocol, we'll treat a patient. And then um, we also have some diseases that no longer have research plans for them that we know what the best thing to do is because we've done it for 20 years and no one has done any other research or the research that has been done hasn't shown any improvement. So we do have basic treatment plans as well. And then there are certain diseases that there's no research available. It's such a rare thing. There's no point in doing any research. So when I told you we have a plan coming in, so when somebody has multiple myeloma, what kind of donor do they have? Is it matched? Is it related mismatch? Is it unrelated? Is it cord blood? Is it autologous? We do very few of these for multiple myeloma. And then we have, this is lifted right out of our uh, clinical coordinators book is what it's called. This is what's called our priority protocol. So if this person matches this, that they are a myeloma without, without eye risk features, this is what we're gonna offer them. If they have symptomatic myeloma, this is what we're gonna offer them. If they're over 75, we can't offer them this one. So this is, and then this is called a treatment plan, STP, standard uh, treatment plan. And this is what we offer. Now we still keep data on everybody. So it's not like we don't keep the data because we wanna be able to, we wanna be able to publish this research. Uh, so even somebody who is, even somebody who's transplanted on this, we will still keep the data and say, on this treatment plan, you know, we've transplanted 5,000 people and, and these are re the results. So we use that information. So what is transplant conditioning? It can be high dose chemotherapy, it can be low dose chemotherapy, it can be yttrium 90, it can be iodine 138 and uh, combined with a protein. It, and those two are um, radiation, treatment radiations, and these things are radiations that go inside the body. They have very, very tiny radiation ranges. So like this stuff, if it's sitting here, isn't gonna affect me at all because it, the radiation is like here, it's like cellular level. The I-131 is not, it's, it's actually radioactive iodine and it has a long, a pretty uh, short half-life. So yeah, I wouldn't want it to be sitting here in an unleaded container. But the idea behind this is, is that it's attached to an antibody, it sticks to the cancer cell and just does most damage to the cancer cell and minimal damage to the healthy, uh, healthy cells. The big thing is we're trying to, what we're trying to do here is also to prevent as many side effects as we can and all the kind of conditioning. And you may see patients in the hospital. I assume you all go to the hospital as well. So you may see the patients getting their conditioning in the hospital, in the outpatient department, or for the children over at the inpatient. Now children all get, can all get, all, sorry, they all get their chemotherapy over you know, uh, their children's hospital. They never give chemotherapy to kids in the outpatient department. You're gonna hear these words, fertologous transplants, melphalan, cytoxin, beam, that's a combination of four different, Okay. I can't, I can't, I can't read, okay, I can't read it because of the light. <laughs> okay. Dexamethasone to prevent uh, nausea as well as treatment for multiple myeloma, cisplatin and doxorubicin, all big guns chemotherapy. For allogeneic treatment, cytoxin, fludarabine, ATG, thiotepa, etoposide, VP16 is what we usually call it, and then radiation. This is a LINAC treatment right here. It's over at the University of Washington. We also have them downstairs. And the patient is, stands up. This, this is where the radiation comes out. Between here and there, they get their radiation. You can't taste, feel, or see, or anything about radiation. It, it's kind of dangerous that way. We have different levels of toxicity to our conditioning. Myeloablative, Milo is the adverb that you would use, I'm sorry, adjective that you would describe uh, marrow high intensity treatment so it's bad it's it's what kills the, the biggest 
bulks of tumor. Now, I'm not all tumors are radioactive sensitive, by the way, so just to let you know that, so we don't use it for all transplants. It destroys the immune system. It not only kills the tumor cells, but it actually kills off the immune system. It's used for auto and allo transplants. It's the greatest toxicity. We cannot give it to people under the age of 65. With the exception of our so-called mini transplant, and we give them a mini radiation dose as well. And for allogeneic myeloblative transplants, and it's high dose chemotherapy and or high dose radiation. The younger the patient, the more toxic the regimen. Reduced intensity, so you're gonna see some of these things. We're trying, we're trying different kinds of protocols that have the big guns chemotherapy effect without the big guns chemotherapy side effects. And triosulfan is one of those. And these people actually do amazingly well. We call that um, reduced intensity, which is not the same thing as non-myoblative or what we call mini transplants. Older patients can tolerate a mini transplant because they have smaller doses of chemotherapy and a very small dose of radiation. It's really kind of amazing. If you knock out the immune system, your immune system, you can pour in brand new cells that haven't had any kind of chemotherapy and they will overtake the old cells. And this was developed by one of our physicians, Reiner Storb, who is now 83, I think, years old, still going amazingly strong because as the transplanters aged out of regular transplant, they wanted to come up with something a little less toxic so they too could experience a transplant if they needed to. And where does cancer happen in, patient, in people in their older years? Cancer is of the blood cells is an old person's disease. Mostly, obviously that's not true because you have children's hospitals full of them, but that's where the big bulk of certain kinds of diseases happen. The big benefit of an allogeneic transplant is the immune system actually comes in, takes over, and clears out the cancer cells. Okay. Unfortunately, the toxicity up front for non-myeloablative transplants is easier on a person, but the long-term side effects exactly the same. So up front easier, back half just as bad. And then this is also when you're also going to hear about tandem transplants. So we have tandem auto-auto, we have tandem auto-allo. Not as many as we used to, but we do have those. Everybody has a central line. Yeah, you've probably seen them, right? Hickman, Berbiac catheter, we use them for everything, blood draw, giving everybody everything they need to have. And there's pictures of them if you've never seen one before. You'll see dressings on people, and sometimes people who've had a Hickman line for a year, don't, they don't use dressings anymore, not unusual. This transplant day itself is very anticlimactic, I have to say, in terms of you've worked your way up to it, and in comes the bag, and that's it. There's no more. And, but it's celebrated, obviously, by patients and staff alike because it means a chance at new life. The one place you will see, you will not see, in the, one thing you will not see in the outpatient department is cord blood. Cord blood is always given in, in the hospital. There's this thing called uh, heart shock with given with cord blood, and people can have heart attacks. Uh, it's actually not the kind of heart attack that you have, you know, when you're vessels are blocked it's it's like a it's a heart it's literally is a heart shock and so people are always very well monitored and then doesn't happen very often day zero so you always hear about days day 120 day one day 60 day 30 uh, day 28 bone marrow day 56 bone marrow we count just like a new brand new baby we count day zero as being transplant day because we base all of our post-transplant immune suppression on that and then we also do all our evaluations based on the day so by the time they leave it's around day 100 for an allogeneic transplant so transplant complications just like with any kind of chemotherapy that you've seen elsewhere it's the standard stuff fevers and infection nausea vomiting can't eat or drink bleeding organ failure so graft versus host disease i'll get into that later that's for allogeneic transplants, graft versus host disease for auto transplants. It's called pseudo GVH. And after all this, there's still about a 40 to 60% relapse rate for patients. And there's lots of long term side effects. Engraftment is that period of time between the time they get their chemotherapy and their cells come in. It's 
Engraftment is two days of the neutrophil ANC or ANC that's come in. Day 28, you shouldn't be getting platelet counts anymore. Shouldn't, shouldn't. That doesn't mean you shouldn't. You aren't, but you shouldn't. Everything improves over the course of time. Once those white cells come in, they come in, they clean everything up, and people should just start feeling better. And then, then you start feeling good. You've got a couple good weeks, and then graft-versus-host disease hits. Now, I want to talk a little bit about donors first, and then I'm going to go back to long-term complications, just because the mobilization of stem cells is very much the same as it is for autologous stem cell transplants. You're going to encounter related donors, and they go through the same medical, they go through evaluation and testing. Basically, for a donor, we want to make sure their counts are okay, their heart, lungs, and livers are okay to withstand the graphers, the, graphers, the GCSF that they're going to get. It's not a major workup. We are concerned about older donors having the potential for cancer, so we ask that they have a complete review before they come in. So if they're due for a colonoscopy, please do that. I mean, we want them healthy when they show up. We do not want women to be pregnant. That's very important. The other thing that's about donors is donors should not be coerced. So if you feel like the pressure is on for a donor to give stem cells, uh, please let us know. The other thing um, is that with the whole consenting process is they also do not need to participate in research, okay? So just let you know that. They, we offer it to them, but they don't have to do it. And they have, the mobilization for peripheral blood stem cells is a simple growth factor, five, four or five days, then they go on apheresis. But sometimes they actually go to surgery for the harvest. A lot of times what you're gonna see is that you'll be with one, one interpreter will be with the family and you'll be with, an, with the donor. The important thing is, is the teams that take care of the patient and donor are not the same thing. Now, they are on the children's side because there's only one children's group, but what they do is the attending is not the same attending that takes care of the, the donor as the attending that takes care of the child. Of course, they all sit in the same room, but the provider and the nurse are also different, so they try and break it up as much as they can. They collect and they get the GCF and apheresis. But the big thing is, is that they're free to go the day after. They're, people recover very quickly from per, the peripheral blood stem cells. They're achy, got a little bit of headaches, they're tired. I mean, they're, they've had a drug they didn't need for five days and then they had the apheresis. But they recover very, very quickly. Surgery takes more time. People are usually not back to the, their normal selves if they're any, anywhere above the age of 30. For a good month. I mean, their, their hips hurt, their backsides hurt a lot. But the young people, I mean, you know, they get up and go back to their track without any trouble whatsoever. So after we get those stem cells that are collected from a related donor, then the next, and then the graftment incurs. Anytime after engraftment incurs, graft versus host disease. And this is the big thing with allogeneic transplants. Okay, so what graft versus host disease and a little bit, I'll explain it a little bit deeper, is the new immune system attacking the body. That's what it is, okay? We, so we give a lot of drugs to prevent this from happening. And these are the ones you're gonna be familiar with, tacrolimus or TAC, cyclosporin, methotrexate, ATG, abatacept, and cytoxin. We try and prevent that reaction from happening in a variety of different ways, depending on what kind of transplant they've had. So graft versus host disease, by definition, is a condition that happens after allogeneic bone marrow transplant in which the donor cells attack the patients and tissues, okay? So bad chronic graft versus host disease, whoops, I apologize, right here, can really affect the quality of life. If you get chronic graft versus host disease, you're in treatment for a long time, Biggest cause of death is infections. It can cause disability, and it really can impact your quality of life. So you just, you survive a fatal illness, and then you get this. It's a chronic autoimmune disease, and it can be pretty brutal. The biggest thing about it, though, is if you get chronic graft versus host disease, your risk of relapse is nil, almost. It's amazing. This is where we found this out as we did 
as people survive transplant in the beginning, in, their, in the beginning, and I'm talking about the 60s, uh, 70s and 80s, when we got all these new infection antivirals and everything, people survived transplant. I mean, there was this big phase where people just simply didn't get through transplant. And as we had this huge body of people surviving, we realized that people, the syngeneic, the twins relapsed, the T cell depleted marrows relapsed, the HLA siblings relapsed, but the unrelated donors had less, more GVH, but less relapse. So how do we use that to keep people well? And this is just a picture of this. And this is really important actually for CAR T, uh, not CAR T cells, but immunotherapy. And the reason is, so the new immune cells attack the liver, the gut, and the skin, okay? There is another thing that you're not gonna run across very often, and that's called graft rejection. And that's where the new immune system actually kills off the new bone marrow, the, the new bone marrow stem cells. You're not going to see that very often, fortunately, because of the kind of chemotherapy and the treatment that we give. What we do in those cases is, is we give them a mini transplant just to get those new cells in. So there is transplant rejection, but it's very, very, very uncommon. So graft versus host disease. It happens 30 to 40 percent, upwards of 50 percent between related donors. The degree of graft versus host disease between related donors, how severe it is, is less in a related donor than, a unre than an unrelated donor. Cord blood, if you can get past all the infection complications, they generally have a lower rate of graft versus host disease, which means they also have a higher rate of relapse. So it, again, it's that double-edged sword there. It's much higher between unrelated donors and the recipients. And we can also do matched and mismatched transplants. So the higher the mismatch, then the worse it is. Symptoms. It attacks the gut. Nausea. What happens when your gut's attacked? Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, jaundice. But chronic graft, and this is true, acute symptoms, a triad. It's going to be those three. Chronic graft versus host disease, it's an autoimmune disease. It's like scleroderma, dry eyes, mouth, hair loss. I mean, this is uh, lung problems. People have required and, and received successful lung transplants because of that. It is the most common trans. Okay. I, I, my eyesight's not real good that far away. Um, trans and I'm almost done. It's the most common transplant problem post allogeneic transplant. You may think you're scot free, but six months to a year, six months to a year, you can end up, you know, you no know chronic graft versus host disease. And as we try and taper away the immune suppression, then the, the chronic graft versus disease can uh, kick in. And then it also can happen, small percentages happen after a year. We've had some people who've had severe sun exposure. Also, people who've had severe infections, um, trauma happened to them where GBH kicks in, chronic graft versus host disease. And we think it's because it's an immune system response. <clears throat> You'll see, yeah. Just a quick question. So can GBH D be considered as a rejection? Uh, the question is, can GBHD be considered a rejection? No, rejection is when the, when the body's immune cells get rid of the new immune, get rid of the new marrow. Does, like I said, it doesn't happen very often. Yeah, so rejection is when the new stem cells actually get kicked out. Okay. You're gonna run into long-term follow-up visits. It's for a week, we do a complete eval, we give vaccines, and we also make plans for the, for the next year. So you may, be, you may encounter those. The autologous folks also come back for a year. Their visits are a little briefer and it's really mostly an assessment of their original disease. And then the other thing is, is that we have a lot of maintenance protocols going on for auto transplants now to try and get rid of and keep away the disease. And that's what the Revlimid and Nilaro is all about. So you might encounter those. So survival and relapse. Chronic GVH, you can see the incidence here, and you can see it's pretty high, extensive GVH, but people do survive, you know, 
This also tells you that if you are transplanted early in your disease, your survival is better than if your disease is more advanced. And that's true of a related donor and an unrelated donor. So, you, you know, the best transplants give us only between 40 to 50 percent survival. I mean, this is not a cure all for a disease. It's like if it works, it's great. And if it doesn't, that's, that's, it's really sad. And they've gone through a lot for it. The reason I wanted to show you this, and this, this statistic has not changed, is for all disease categories, the biggest reason people die is their relapse. Now, it doesn't look like that down here, but what happens is that when you combine chronic GVH and infection, uh, people die of graft-versus-host disease because they die of infection. The immune system is so messed up. But it's interesting, you look at this, unrelated donors do have less disease relapse than a related donor. And an autologous transplant, because there's no new immune system, that's what happens, their disease comes back. So these are some of the big complications that you might see in a long-term follow-up uh, visit. Chronic graft versus disease, diabetes from the steroids then be, that they're having, lung disease, oops, and this one. You have an increased risk of secondary cancers. And this is just some nice alphabet soup. Every time you come in for an interpreting, you know we use abbreviations all the time. So I just thought I'd give you a little list of them. We call BMT both things here, peripheral uh, bone marrow and blood and marrow, peripheral stem cell, PBSCT, HSCT, that's hematopoietic, that's our blood system. We use the HCT for both hematopoietic stem cell and hematocrit. UCB cord blood, GBHD, long-term follow-up, CSB cyclosporin, MMF. That's one of the post-transplant immune suppression drugs. Uh, mycophenolate, mofetil, WBCs for RBCs, and platelets. So you have all of those slides in the manual I sent you yesterday. Yes. Yeah. 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 So you want to stand up and stretch for a second? <laughs> so just imagine, you guys, just imagine all the stuff that I just told gone through here. Now, put the stress of you have to worry about your kids, your dogs, your cats, your farm, your family, your work, and you have a fatal disease. And then you have to learn all that the first week you're here in transplant. Uh, I think we're going to have some uh, space to actually talk about when you are in interpretation, when you have to get a, a conference mm -hmm. with just patients arrive to the clinic. Because um, I, 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 the thing is that trying to talk about it, we have a break to go out. I'm not sure. Is there a question that are directly? Yeah, and then it's, it's, it's just a comment or? regarding when Anthony. Oh, sure, why don't you say, while everybody's stretching, why don't you assess me? Yeah, it's yeah. basically yeah. when you are giving the conferences where um, based on experience interpreting, as you mentioned, patients are uh, experiencing a lot of trauma and concern, and um, it's, they can hardly understand what's going on, why they got this. And then it comes with a lot of terminology they have never, ever heard in their lives, and then they have a language barrier. Mm -hmm. So on top of those things, you as an interpreter are the main contact for what's going on, and you have to make sure that that communication actually happens. So um, I think it's very important to have more time special for patients that are going to get the conferences when they have an interpreter. And um, the level of education of many of the patients we work with is very basic. So the terminology all together, and when you envision when you guys use abbreviations, they're not. But they are really difficult for patients and to get them locked on the system. So, uh, especially in those initial conferences, I think it's very important to mention everything, like not to, to try not to abbreviate that much, because then uh, we have to go out uh, and say the whole thing, uh, just to make sure that the, the whole term, to make sure that it's understood. And on top of that, we have to many times uh, rephrase and double phrase because you can tell culturally when the patient is not getting it. And, and that's part of what I experienced as a doctor. So one of the things that, you know, I've, I've been in tons of these conferences. Um, one of the role of the nurse in the conference is not to just sit there like a bump on a log. We're, part of our job is to actually 
know whether we think the patient is understanding this. We can always do another conference. We can always stop. And I encourage you as interpreters to do two things. One is that if you feel like the patient is not understanding, is to say, excuse me, doctor, these, these explanations are too complex for this patient. Can you, can you either simplify them? Can you describe, just say, can you describe them a certain way? My patient isn't under, the patient is not understanding this. And remember to refer to yourself as the interpreter. Right. You do that because you interpret. And the other thing that's really important too is that the ones, the conferences that we've really been the worst, most worried about is when an interpreter, you know, they will say some, what seems something very simple. Um, your stem cells will, will come and they will be infused. And then you spend three minutes explaining that. And then we'll say, well, what, what were you explaining to them? Oh, I was just making sure they understood. And it's like, yeah, what were you, you know, when we ask you, what are you telling the patient? We really want to know because um, we need to make sure that what you're saying to them is what we're trying to get across to them as well so that there's no confusion about that. So and as the interpreter your role is not to explain, it's okay. to interpret. It's better to signal to the provider mm -hmm. that the interpreter feels the patient is not understanding and then can can you paraphrase? Yeah. And then have them paraphrase rather than you yeah. getting into the yeah. because, because the big yeah. thing is it, it's yeah. just it just oh, wow. all you have to do because I mean I've been in conferences where the first language is English and I've said to the doctor, you know, I think that maybe what they're asking is this because I I want to I, I want to be kind to the physician, but these guys don't think like everybody else. Yeah. I mean they're thinking up here, right? And yeah. I'm thinking in non, I'm trying to think in non-medical language, and so the nurses also spend a lot of time interpreting after the doctors leave. That, that's a protective point of extending the time for and they should be longer when conferences have, when you have interpretation. Yeah, because There's, you will say, um, and then the interpreter will refer to the interpreter in the like the first um, saying for personal what's going on as though you were the doctor or the nurse, and then that communication goes to the patient. Then the patient makes the space where. Uh, okay, so the interpreter can read that because culturally we attach to the presentation as well, mm -hmm. and then say, Well, interpreter the patient, uh, do you mean as a doctor this, this, this? Can I, do you allow me to rephrase this in this way mm -hmm. so that I am sure that that's going to happen? So it's a lot of um, mm -hmm. uh, structure that interpreters must follow, mm -hmm. but we need time for that structure. Too. The conferences yeah. with an interpreter are supposed to be longer. And if you're not and we, finding, we can bring that up with it. Yes. Yeah. 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 So if you're finding that that's not true, they're supposed to be longer. They're supposed to be ninety minutes, because it has you have to account for things being said three times, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. First one, two, three, twice, I guess. Yeah. One last question here. Well, it's not a question. I, I tend to disagree with her when uh, we can't teach the doctors how to explain things, you know. But when there are abbreviations, yeah. You say you wanted the whole name of the thing. I think that would even make it worse if it, the doctor doesn't use abbreviations and says the whole name. So, you know, it's the way they talk, but the only way to clarify that when we notice that the patient is kind of like drifting, what, what is this? Then, you know, we can interpret it talking. You know, I don't think that. Yeah, and we appreciate that. Because even an abbreviation or whole names are not going to be anything anyway. It's, okay. so, yeah, you know, it's, well, I, and I totally disagree with that because we have GBHD for and we always, we come to a patient and they say GBHD all the time, which is why I know that she has uh, in, uh, you have to say you have the one to work with, not abbreviation. Abbreviation around yeah. is in Spanish. It's in, in Spanish, it's not mean anything. And that doesn't mean they're going to understand that. It, well, it is relevant point in the sense that some languages just don't use abbreviations as much as English. Yeah, exactly. Actually, in English, I think the languages speak more out of abbreviations, especially in medical terminology. Oh yeah, definitely. Yes. Are these are these sessions are they recorded? 
they uh, they can be recorded by the patient. Okay. We do not record them. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll, they'll just, uh, oh. That just seems like a real. That would be a really good. A lot of people, have, you know, now that everybody seems to have a smartphone, a lot of people record them. Mm -hmm. But it's, it seems that, that that would be. That's illegal. So, no, it's no, not. It's not. Uh, no, the no, the, no. the breast cancer clinic, they do record, they, uh, doctors record the conversations. They, the, um, mm -hmm. uh, three or four doctors and the clinic themselves, they record the, the, for the conference. The conference. Yeah, for the yeah, conference. Yeah, they, they do my gastro. gastro. Oh, I've never got a gastro. It days. seems that, that that would be a good protocol to add. I didn't was unaware that we work in silos. I was unaware that they do that. Yeah, in, bre in the breast in the breast cancer unit, they do. Yeah. Mm. And then they what do they do? Give a copy to the patient. To the patient because yeah, because you. because uh, at least from some of friends who have had that experience, as soon as the as soon as the doctor says you have cancer, the brain yeah, just oh, of closes course. down. Yeah. And then there's another forty five minutes of information and it just blows by right. so, so oh. can you could you email me yeah. back yeah yeah, so yeah. So yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So they can go back and hear it again yeah yeah I did, when I their brain that. comes on again okay. Yes. okay you guys you ready to hear about the immune uh, therapy actually I, I, I do have a question for you uh, so in, um, just <laughs> please bear with me I think right. it's a two-part question but um, in Journal of Insurance Law in pursuit of trying to get a better idea there's a uh, there's an ethical uh, dilemma uh, with regard to umbilical cord uh, uh, no, well with the, with the umbilical cord process uh, where there are licensed and unlicensed based on the 2014 federal law that was passed and uh, for collecting cord bags? exactly uh -huh. and uh, the fact that those from prior to 2014 are still being used because they're you know, kept yeah, they're grandfathered. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, is is there, um, there seems to be a controversy, at least among those who make their living in insurance, um, as to the efficacy of those particular cells, where doctors say they're perfectly fine, but the federal government has passed a different series of laws. Uh, so that's the statement. Uh, the question is, um, what type of uh, additional information uh, can be provided to patients uh, to allay their concerns regarding uh, the cord blood that's been kept prior to or grandfathered in, as you've stated. I think that one of the biggest things you could probably explain to them is that the method of... Well, I can't explain it. Okay, <laughs> well, but... <laughs> so, are you asking me to... what the doctor should say? Well, um, what I'm asking is, um, there is an additional elaboration, and what these folks are talking about is the meta interpreter experience, where the interpreter has to step out of not the role of the interpreter, but where the interpreter is explaining why there is, there are these additional questions, right? It, with regard to the cord blood controversy, um, but the questions are coming from from the patient. Um, where the patient is being told, oh, don't worry, these are grandfathered in, and uh, they... And then the patients have further questions, or they or, don't know what that means. Or, exactly. And, and sometimes, because of a variety of cultures okay. and so forth, some patients are unwilling to, um, to put forth that question. Uh, but you can see that they're kind of uh, in shock or unaware, even not even knowing what to ask in some cases. Uh, so I, I'm just wondering, um, you know, how is that being addressed? Uh, because there, there, there does seem to just, uh, We can, uh, I think this is more of a situation, how to handle the situation. It's more of interpreter ethics, how to deal with the scenario. So uh, No, no, I'm not talking about the meta experience interpretation. What I'm talking about is uh, the fact that this often gets blown by. And there is this controversy. It does exist. But... Um, often um, it's simply disregarded or told, or the patient or family is told, um, you know, uh, we keep it and it's fine. We disagree with the federal government and that's fine. Uh, 
so it's unlicensed. Okay, so at this point, this is a statement uh, to let Pat know, I understand, that this is a concern that you have, mm -hmm. and the rest of the discussion, I think, how to deal with it, it would be something that we in, talk in ethics, about right. in the ethics part, sure. because, for example, but I when, when you feel like, oh, the, the, the patient part. is making an expression that they're not understanding, or then you can communicate that if you feel that it's important. And just like we stated before, I feel the patient is not, uh, the interpreter feels that the patient is not understanding. Right. 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 I noticed that uh, Mrs. Goff is not uh, in the ethics part. That's one thing. The other thing is, I'm just wondering how it's actually being addressed as an ethical question in the medical community. It's it, not. It's not an ethical issue for the medical community. Oh, okay. Because uh, okay, and the so reason. And I guess it is for insurers. Does that does that make sense? It, there are lots of regulations that are passed by the FDA and the and in an effort to standardize care these regulations are passed because this is an incredibly profitable thing and so people are coming up with blood banks at storing unrelated cord blood because it's incredibly profitable the cord blood one cord blood costs sixty thousand dollars Okay, so why wouldn't you start up a cord blood? So what they've done is they have said from this day forward, anybody who supplies a cord blood has to be licensed. But they also said we have, uh, and, and these things, these, these blood banks are the same blood banks providing present license and prior unlicensed blood bank. They haven't changed anything in what they've done. And these blood banks, all these core bloods, all come from public blood banks. They don't come from private uh, self storage, as it will. So anybody who stores their core blood for themselves that is taken out of the pool, and so these all these people who have donated their core bloods are done it out of their out of their heart, you know, willingness to do it. And so there's no, uh, it's not like someone who might store core blood and they know they have a history of HIV but didn't tell anybody or anything like that. So in the medical community, there is no controversy about using unlicensed. We find when this came up, we found it to be ridiculous. And there are often, ridic there are often ridiculous regulations produced by people who don't understand what's going on. Okay, let me give you a perfect example of this. The FDA says any unit of, of uh, unrelated, any unrelated donor bag of red, uh, I'm sorry, stem cells that come from Europe have to be marked, um, oh my God, that's the word for it, not ineligible, have to be marked unsuitable. They have, unsuitable, because anybody who's been in Europe has a risk of having mad cow disease, okay? So the FDA says that. There's another regulatory branch, uh, oh, and so there's another regulatory branch of the government that said all health, private health information has to be protected from public view. So the FDA says it has to be a huge, has to be a huge stamp on the bag that says it's unsuitable, do not give without patient's permission, and another one says that has to be covered up. They don't talk to each other. Anyway, we spent many hours debating, you know, going over this kind of stuff. So fact accreditation for cellular therapy products, I mean, people aren't doing anything any differently. They've written it down and proven that they've done it. So we don't have any problems with using unlicensed cord blood. It's, because of it, yeah, because eventually we'll run out, of, they'll age out. Sure. And from here on out, they'll be okay. Be licensed. They'll be licensed. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we might have two cord bloods, same blood bank that provided them, and one's licensed because it was produced in the last year, and the other one's unlicensed because it was produced three years ago. Why would you not use that cord blood to save that person's life? Yeah, it, it, sometimes we have to, what are they thinking? All right, we have to move to immunotherapy, otherwise you guys yeah, are working great. <laughs> okay, so everything I taught you about the immune system, you're gonna apply to immunotherapy. Okay, but I'm gonna add some stuff in there. Okay, so immunotherapy is very 
Simple. It is using the patient's own immune system to fight cancer. It is stimulating the immune system to fight harder, work harder, work smarter, to attack only cancer cells. And it is utilizing man-made proteins to be able to cause this to happen, okay? So, understanding the immune system. It is a really complex, and it has just gotten more so over the course of the years. It is a the immune system is a combination of the blood stem cells that actually come out of the bone marrow. It's your, it's your liver is one of your biggest sources of your immune system issues and problems. Your gut is your largest immune system in, this, in the body. Now, we've just found this out in the last three years. And that's why graft versus host disease atta attacks the liver and the gut and the skin, because those are some of our biggest immune system organs. And um, the immune system is, we have an immune system to protect us from other than self. So what is other than self? It's everything outside of us. And what's really weird when you think about it is that we are sterile on the inside, but we have a tube that runs from here to there <laughs> that is part of the outside world. And that is why the gut is one of our biggest immune systems in our body because it's trying all day long to keep other from invading self and it's trying to metabolize proteins that are what? Other than cell. When you look at the blood, there are, there are antibodies in our blood that they don't even know what they're supposed to attack. Our blood system is capable of recognizing things that we don't even know what's out there. And you combine them and it, they're amazing. All the different bacteria, all the different viruses, all the different funguses, we're pre-programmed to fight those things. It's amazing when you, and you fight it without ever having been exposed to it first. And that's what a vaccine is. You give a little bit of it, the body goes, hey, I know what that is, because when the real mumps attacks you, it goes after it. That's what the flu vaccine is. That's the immune system in action, and that's what immune therapy is all about. Okay, so you have T cells, lymphocytes are the big thing that we're fight, they're working with here. You have a T cell, T cell lymphocyte. You have a cancer cell. There's a little protein here. There's a little receptor here. They, they lock in. The T cell kills that cancer cell. Happens all day long. Every day we are killing off thousands of abnormal cells in our bodies. But cancer cells, why do they escape? They change that little protein. They create little chemicals that surround this protein that say, hey, I'm not here, you can't see me, I'm not here. They divide endlessly, they overwhelm the T cells. They just keep growing and growing and growing and no matter how many T cells are produced, they can't fight it off. They create proteins that those T cells can't recognize. So even though our bodies are already pre-programmed with all these different means of being able to capture proteins they've never seen before, cancer cells, one of those billions of cancer cells creates one that can't be seen and it escapes detection. And then they go someplace they don't belong and that's called metastasis. So here are the key players, the, T, the lymphocytes. There are two different kinds of lymphocytes. One's called a killer T cell, and T cell and that's the one that binds directly. There's another one called a helper T cell and they gather up all the little proteins that aren't supposed to be there and present them. It's called an antigen, antigen presenting cell. And these are words you might hear needing to be interpreted. The B cells are the other, a different kind of lymphocyte, and they make antibodies. So antibodies are those great things, they're great proteins that go along and they bind up with those bad things and kill them off. An antigen is simply a protein. It is, it's just another name for a protein. If you have an antibody, you gotta have an antigen. Maybe I had to come up with a name. An antibody is produced by your B lymphocytes. So when you get a vaccine, they're produced, um, the B lymphocytes gear up, and then when they, and then they tamp down again. And then when you see the real thing come in, then they, they gear up really fast. They don't have that two to three week lag time of trying to produce enough. And then the proteins or the antigens on the surfaces, you're gonna hear 
these are targeted. So they, the research scientists, scientists have designated these, these proteins that are on the cells by name. So this is called CD is cluster differentiation 52. And they had to come up with something like HER2. So it, it describes what the different proteins do. So here's a great picture of it. You've got, <coughs> and you've got a foreign protein. I don't care what kind of foreign protein it is. It goes, an antigen presenting cell sucks it in. The helper T cell presents it, uh, can help the B cells make these things and then they make antibodies. So this gets presented to this one and this guy makes the antibodies. This help, help T helper T cell can create uh, macrophages. They grow into macrophages. Macrophages and other specialized cells that helps to kill things. And then they also make killer T cells. So it's complex. You know, that's like what I understand of it, okay? And I had to be reminded of it when I saw it. So what's a cancer cell? Why is a cancer cell different from all other cancers, from all other cells? I went over it. It evades the immune system. It replicates lim uh, limitlessly. Apoptotic is a fancy word for an exploded cell. It's a great word. I love it. So what happens is that our cells normally die after 60 replications. That's, that's the normal process. And what happens is in a cancer cell, that signaling process is, is killed. It's, it's dead. And so it continues to replicate. Sustained angiogenesis. Angio, angio is blood and genesis is creation. So what happens is they call in si to signals to create its own blood supply. And that's why, that's another thing. But it's a fragile blood supply. It's, it's susceptible to chemo uh, chemotherapy agents that we've come up immunotherapy agents that we've come up with. A replication, a replication checkpoint. The reason I stuck this is in here is that checkpoint inhibitors are a fancy new level of immunotherapy drugs. And a checkpoint is a place where a cell turns on and off. It's all it is. It's just like when you're going through a country, you're going through uh, immigration checkpoint back in Europe, European days when you go from France to Germany. Checkpoint is where you're stopped or allowed to go or allowed to uh, have to stay. They suck up energy. That's why a PET scan works because they suck up the sugar that's in a PET scan. It invades and metastasizes. Your liver cell knows to stay in your liver. Your heart cells don't go anywhere. Your skin cells stay in your skin. And remarkably so, you've got different kinds of toughness of skin and every, they know where to go. You're not going to have fingerprints on your forehead, right? <laughs> they, they can keep growing and they ignore the anti-growth signals. So immunotherapy targets a cancer cell's weakness. And these are the different things that you're going to see. You're going to see monoclonal antibodies. You're going to see vaccines. Vaccines are different from oncolytic viral immunotherapy, and I'll explain how. Checkpoint inhibitors, those are drugs, and immune system modulators, and CAR T cells. I'm going to explain all these. Monoclonal antibodies, you're going to see it written as MAB, monoclonal antibodies. So what happens is that on those, the surface of the cell, that, the, that antigen has been identified, and unfortunately, antibodies Gotta put it. Cancer cells will have normal proteins on them that are on normal cells as well. So monoclonal antibodies affect normal cells as well. But to give you a good example of this, there's a disease called chronic lymphocytic leukemia, where one kind of lymphocyte is produced in the hundred thousands. I mean, it's really, it's really big. It makes you really sick. You just have too many white cells. And they're all actually fairly mature cells. There's nothing really particularly wrong with them, except they don't work real well. Um, but there's just too many of them. So there is an antibody, and um, a monoclonal antibody that's been produced that targets the normal protein that's on that cell. Binds them, kills them all. But then you don't have any of those cells left at all. So then you might have some risk of infection, but then you don't have too many. And so it's a, they're not a perfect cure, but they're a way of controlling a disease. The other thing is, whoops, 
The other thing is that's so clever is that we can create an antibody that attacks to the antigen, and then we can attach chemotherapy or radiation to the, that antibody. That's really cool. The antibody, with or without that chemo or radiation, seeks out that antigen to kill it. And the interesting thing is that most of these antibodies were started with mouse models, with mouse um, proteins, because mice are, uh, research mice are very interesting creatures, and you order them up how you want them to be. It's really fascinating. But they make these antibodies, and uh, the trouble is, is that people can be allergic to mice. And so as times have gone on now, we're trying to create antibodies that are humanized, but there are a lot of different kind of antibodies out there that are still used that are all mouse, partial mice, uh, mostly mice, little human, mostly human, little mouse, and then all human. And they're identified by different names. So here's, the, here's what I was talking about, CAMPATH. If you're down in the hemonc, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, it's anti-CD52. So on these uh, lymphocyte cells, there's that protein, CD52, CAMPATH binds it, kills them all, and they all go away. Herceptin, you're going to see in breast and stomach cancer. So there's a protein on breast and stomach cancers called a HER2. And like I said, they've identified all these proteins by names. So Herceptin binds to that, kills them off. Zevlin, this is a cool one, antibody and radiation attaches to CD20 on some types of lymphoma. Not all. Your disease has to have that antibody on it. Otherwise, it's going to float through and you're going to pee it out. I mean, it's not, it has to bind to something. Um, Brintuximib, again, it's another chemo and, her, uh, anti chemo and antibody attached to HER2. So different diseases can have the same protein on it. So you might have, like for this one, HER2 is in for some kinds of stomach cancers as well as breast cancer. Avastin. Remember I told you that cancer cells can kind of create their own blood supply? That's what Avastin is for. Okay, because they produce not quite normal blood vessels, they've come up with um, an, uh, an antibody that does that. And so tumors that are, have a rich blood supply, they can use that. So it's, it's not the only thing that a cancer would be treated with, it's an adjunct thing. And adjunct means something along with, so it would be part of chemotherapy treatment. So monoclonal side effects. <clears throat> It really depends on where the cancer cell is, what it's working on, and the disease it's being treated. And because it's a foreign protein, what happens when you get infected with a foreign protein? Well, if you are allergic to bee stings, then you can have anaphylactic shock and your blood pressure can disappear and you can stop breathing, okay? This can happen with those things. It's not common, but it can happen. Most typical things are mild allergic reactions such as hives and itching, flu symptoms. I mean, you don't feel good, diarrhea, skin rashes, low blood pressures. There's a lot of things. We have to do a lot of um, pre-medications for this. So people come in, oh, I'm coming in for my Rituxan. I'm gonna be out all day long. I'm gonna get Benadryl and Tylenol and I feel like crap tomorrow. But you know, I feel okay the next day. So that's common. Vaccines, any questions about monoclonal antibodies? You're gonna see them. There's just I could give you a list as long as my arm. There's just going to be more next week. Okay, so that's, going to, that's pretty amazing stuff. So there are vaccines to prevent cancer, and that is the anti-human uh, papillovirus that they're encouraging all 12-year-olds in the country to get now. There's also a hepatitis B vaccine. The reason this one's so important is that um, the biggest cause of liver cancer is hepatitis. And so this prevents one source of that. Now, there are cancers to treat, I'm sorry, there are vaccines to treat cancers. The only one that is currently used right now is called Prevenge, and that's to treat prostate cancer. The problem with this particular one is that it's extremely expensive. And the reason it's so expensive is they actually take each individual person's cancer cells and create a vaccine against that particular cancer. So this is not an off the shelf thing. And it takes about three weeks to get it uh, made, and it works kind of slowly. But it, it does seem to work. Now, there's some really exciting ones used for glioma and kidney pancreatic. 
these are really exciting ones. So if you guys remember Jimmy Carter, the former president was, had glioma, had a glioblastoma clinical trial. That's why he's cured today. So side effects of vaccines. So what happens when you're, you get a flu vaccine? Now, some people are very sensitive to them and other people are not. And, you know, they always say, I swear I got the flu from that flu vaccine. Three days later, I was sick. I had chills. I was aching. I had back pain. I had fever. You, know, you didn't. You had a great reaction to the vaccine. <laughs> and it's like, you're not going to get the flu this year, you hope. That's the reason why a lot of people don't get it. That's they exactly. It. But all it. you're doing is stimulating your immune system. Okay. But the thing is, is that these kinds of vaccines can be pretty brutal. I mean, it's, it's like a specific tack on a cancer cell. So you can feel pretty lousy from these things, but it's working. And it's not like chemotherapy, turn on, turn on. You get the chemotherapy, it kills the cells. These things take time to work. Now, this is, a, you might sound like it's the same thing, but it's not the same thing, okay, as the vaccines. <clears throat> the vaccines are creating antibodies to work against the antigens, okay? Now this is something, this is called an oncolytic viral immunotherapy. And what they're doing is, and there are different kinds, there are different kinds. I was reading about it this morning because I was trying to refresh my memory. There are viruses in us that don't cause much grief to us. I mean, we might have them, a cold virus, for instance. Well, you get a cold, you get over it in seven days, you know, and you're fine. So then there are some viruses that are really awful, like polio viruses and stuff like that. Well, what they do is they take viruses that are not terribly, uh, cause a lot of illness, adenoviruses, a form of a cold virus. They have genetically modified it so that it doesn't attack anything uh, but cancer cells, because remember, cancer cells don't do, they don't do what they're supposed to do. And so they have doorways into them that ordinary regular cells do not. So they inject the virus into the tumor cells. The virus recognizes cancer, cancer antigens and then replicates them. And then the way a virus kills a cell is that it, it grows too big for its britches and, and explodes the cell and dumps all the proteins out. And so it just dumps more virus out. And so it attacks the bloodstream. It attacks all the tumor cells. And then the next one gets infected and then they dump out viral thing. And the big thing is that it then helps the immune system to recognize. So it's sort of like a kickstart to the immune system. The, kick, the immune system hadn't recognized it before. Remember it escaped, uh, it can escape detection. But this virus helps it to do its duty. And so then it's like, oh yeah, I, yeah, I can recognize that, that cancer cell. I'll do my job now. There's only one that's approved right now. So if you're working in dermatology, you might need it. Um, and then uh, this is an incredible area of research because what they're looking at is using viruses that are, that don't affect normal cells at all because the normal cells have the ability to keep them out, but they can get into cancer cells and they don't really specifically recognize anything in there. They just recognize a cell that is, is a, a good host for them. They go in, they make them a lot of viruses all by themselves, and then they explode the cell. And that's the amazing part. I mean, it's just like, anyway. I find these things absolutely fascinating. I mean, this is when you think about what doing this, stimulating the immune system instead of killing all the normal cells with chemotherapy and radiation, this is amazing. Horrendously expensive all these things are, as you can imagine. And then, um, immunotherapy as itself, it's in research, but different treatments. Some, something, well, some things are. under treatment now. So immunotherapy is an umbrella treatment. Mm -hmm. It's all of it trying to get the immune system to work. So there are some things that are, are uh, like the Provenge and the, and, uh, the, that thing that was back there. So I can't even pronounce these things. So some of them are used, but most of them are in clinical right. phase one trials. Okay. Yeah. And that's why we're doing them here at the SCCA because you have to have special um, uh, approval to do phase one trials. So the, the cancer recognition, what, uh, what are the false positives? I mean, uh, are, is there a percentage of... Oh, it's not the same thing. You're talking about disease, you're talking about diagnosis. This is disease, the, this is on the cellular level where the, um, 
the cells are recognized by antigens and by antibodies. That's so, it's 100% recognition or near bounce. So that's the big thing you see is that cancer cells can learn to evade stuff. So you can always have a cancer cell that escapes detection. But what hopefully will happen is that the immune system is revved up enough so that it might be able to recognize it. Yeah, so the, none of these things are perfect. They're, I mean, they're good, but they're not always perfect. Why are our cancer cells so smart? <laughs> yeah, but you know, they could really, they are really smart. They have learned to adapt to this way, to environment, to change, to go these guys. How did you, like, just for the fun. <laughs> so why are cancer cells so smart? I don't know, to give researchers job? I don't know. <laughs> you know what, none of us know. I mean, why, are, why do our bodies fail? They're not yeah. smart, they're just bad. They're just bad. They a lot of it's, not, it's not that they're so smart, it's just that the immune system is failed to recognize them. So it's actually the immune system's fault for not doing its job. So there you go, pin the blame on somebody. So pin the blame on somebody else. So the biggest things with these vaccines, again, it all has to do with what, where the cancer is and what's being treated. So you know, something that's in your brain is what might affect you worse than somebody, than something that's in, in your liver or something like that. So, I mean, it would take me hours to go through everything. But the big thing is, is the fevers that you, I, I corrected that, but all the things that happen when you get a vaccine. And some of these can be very, very bad. And people are like, I can't take these side effects. But they try and ameliorate them by giving them drugs and stuff like that. And then the big thing, that this treatment for melanoma, since it's in fact actually is injected right into the actual tumor, like in melanoma is on the skin most of the time, not always. Um, make sure that if, for whatever reason, you don't touch the dressings. That's just something that was big when I was reading about this. So there, people can, you know, people can decide, can be treated with some of these things and decide not to go forward with them because some of these uh, treatments are repeated. You'll, you'll get some and then you'll get another booster, you know, a little bit bigger booster. And so it's kind of a continuous thing. So some are well tolerated and some are not. So this is a very interesting checkpoint inhibitors. When I first started reading about checkpoint inhibitors, I was like, um, you know, a year ago, I was so confused about what it was that they were actually doing because it, it's like, okay, so does it turn on things or does it turn off things? Does it make something go? Does it make something stop? And the answer was yes. It kind of is a bunch of those different things. So checkpoints are molecules on immune cells that need to be activated or inactivated to start an immune response. So some cancer cells are able to produce, pro, produce chemical signals that tells an immune cell, don't bother me, okay? They just are, They're, that's part of what they can do. So what happens is that people have created drugs, researchers ha that have created drugs to block that signal so that the immune system wakes up and recognizes that stem, that cancer cell is being bad. So this is, this is a great explanation. So the T, T cells have a protein on the cell. It has a name, PD-1, and it's, it is an off switch. So when it attaches to this molecule on the surface of the cancer cell, it tells it to turn off, okay? So what happens, um, I'm sorry, it doesn't turn off the cancer cell, it turns off the lymphocyte. So the cancer cell says, hey, I'm not really here. I'm cool, leave me alone. So what happens is you give them this drug that attaches here and all of a sudden the T lymphocyte wakes up and recognizes the cancer cell. So these That's two because then that position is already blocked and the position is blocked okay. and then that what's happened is the checkpoint inhibitor opens it up it it unblocks it in other words so all of a sudden the cancer cell is left vulnerable for recognition we have two that are uh, currently used 
Kytruda and uh, Opdivo, you guys have all seen advertisements for these on the TV, mm -hmm. affects different kinds of um, cancers, non-small non cell lung cancer, melanomas, squamous cell, renal cell, all these different things. And these though, these are not targeted therapies, okay? And the, they're targeted to, an, to a particular kind of place on the molecule. But what happens if you release the off switch for all T lymphocytes? Then they're going to start being reactive against the body. Mm. So it's not just these things. Of course, they kill them. They're more sensitive. So you figure you're going to have more cell kill on the cancer cells. But unfortunately, these things affect all cells. So what happens is that you turn off the immune system, you turn off the immune system breaks. What do you have? You have graft versus host disease. Okay, that's the same kind of thing in the immune system that has been turned off. It's so the immune system here again is being revved up and it's going to attack anything it can see. It's like it, it's like the blinders have been taken off. It's like, oh yeah, I'm awake, I'm awake, I'm gonna go attack something. Yeah, that's a normal cell, but that's too bad because it's in my way. <laughs> it's collateral damage. <laughs> so what happens is that these um uh, these checkpoint inhibitors attacks the rash. GBH is a rash. And I'm not saying they're the same thing. I'm saying that the immune system is attacking the same areas because it's an immune system response. Severe diarrhea. These people have to stop this drug because they can have a severe colitis and be very sick. They can get hepatitis. They can get pancreatitis. They can lose their pituitary and thyroid glands, so they have to have lifelong um, replacements for those things, intense <clears throat> fatigue. So these things are not chemotherapy, but they're still attacking normals. They end up attacking normal cells, yeah. Is there a graft in that? No, <laughs> what, I was trying, no what I was trying to explain is it's, in a, it's the immune system gone awry. It's the immune system gone crazy and it doesn't recognize what it's supposed to. Yeah. yeah. Is this similar to what happens when uh, a person with HIV has a really high load, uh, viral load, and their immune system has been suppressed and they go on antiretrovirals? Uh huh. And to the point where, I mean, I've seen deaths occur because the response was so huge. Uh, you mean from the antiretroviral, from the drugs themselves? From, from their immune systems coming back on board. Ah. Uh -huh. I, you know, I'm totally unfamiliar with it. Okay. So the question for the video thing is, uh, does hepatitis see the death that happened because the immune system gives revved up? You know, I'm totally unfamiliar with that. But at any rate, a, a revving up immune system after being suppressed or can be quite. Like, a, a, I think this question maybe that overreactive immune system yeah, right. can be very yeah. dangerous yeah. for the body because it can actually kill you. Yeah. yeah. And that's what autoimmune Bye, diseases are. Mm -hmm. right. That's exactly right. So uh, these things are called immune system modulators. So you might run into this on the third and fourth floors for different kinds of diseases. So uh, uh, interleukin-2, it's an old drug. It's been around for a long time. And it's been used in uh, a lot of different kinds of diseases to help rev up the immune system. Now, it's a general rever-upper. It's not, it isn't really... Um, it's not really specific, and but it's been used for a long. I apologize. Hit the wrong one. It's been used for a long time for kidney cancer and metastatic melanoma. So what it does is that it helps the immune system to kind of rev up and maybe recognize. So you know they can use IL two with those other drugs. So they they can use IL two with the vaccines, the oncolytic vaccines. So these things can be used in tandem. Interferon alpha is another thing that boost the ability of certain immune cells to attack cancer cells. And again, they used it like Avastin, they used it to slow blood, vessel, um, blood vessels that tumors needed to grow. And it's used in these diseases right here. So you might see them if you're working with any people uh, with these diseases, you might see it. Again, this is never used by itself. It's always used in conjunction with something else. And this is an interesting one. I actually didn't know about it that uh, they introduce this uh, bacterium into the bladder to treat bladder cancer. And it's very specific because it revs up the immune system, the T lymphocytes just right in the bladder. 
and it gets rid of the cancer. It's like it's like there's been a uh, there's been a failure. Cancer is basically a failure of the immune system to function properly. And again, always the immune system side effects are where the disease is and where it's working on the cancer cell. But the big thing about IL-2, actually for high dose IL-2, you have to be in the hospital to receive this. You have to be in ICU because you can have this massive leaking out of, uh, it's called capillary leak syndrome and you're, you know, basically your blood system can't be held inside the, the blood vessels anymore. It kind of gets, it gets leaky, very, very sick very, very sick. So you have to, it's, you're carefully monitored for that. Interferon alpha was used for years and years and years for hepatitis C. That's what was used to treat before we had these fantastic new drugs that they have. But it revved up the immune system and got rid of the hepatitis. So CAR T cells, I think this is what most people are familiar with that we have recently uh, been doing over the last year. It was brand new last year and uh, for us at any rate. And uh, actually CAR T's have been used in different parts of the country. Uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP, was the first, first place that started it. And I think everybody has seen the newspaper articles about the, sorry, social media articles about the 14-year-old girl that was cured of cancer. You know, and that's what we're trying to do here. So what we're trying to do with CAR T cells is to create a very targeted treatment to attack one specific kind of tumor cell, not attack the, not have the immune system work up everything, but this again is using the immune system to kill your cancer cell. It's used for very specific diseases right now, B cell, acute ALL, acute lymphocytic leukemia, or lymphomas <clears throat> currently. Currently, there are in the pipeline CAR T cells for lymph, uh, melanoma, breast cancer, brain cancer, glioblastomas, Merkel cell, it's another kind of leukemia. So there are, these things are all supposed to come online in the summer. Currently, it's used as a bridge to transplant or as a post-transplant treatment for lymphoma and relapsed lymphoma and leukemia. And um, it's also used, like, a, uh, like I said, treatment. And it's clinical trials only. There are no uh, off the shelf T cells. Now they're going to start a trial for off the shelf CAR T cells in uh, the summertime. And we'll be one of a couple, uh, two different institutions that are going to be allowed to use that. I just learned about that last week. So uh, it couldn't be used instead of the transplant then now? Possibly, but I'll explain why it might not work. Mm -hmm. So, what we're doing right now, so what we found is that. People who have an enormous, so go back, let me go back a step, which I didn't explain before. Transplant, you want the least amount of disease you can possibly have to go into transplant for it to be successful because that immune system response takes months to really kick into gear. So for someone who has a large disease burden, a lot of leukemia, has a large um, lymphomas, you want them to be treated before they go to transplant. And so this has been very successful to get people to transplant. And it's been very successful to treat people after transplant because it gives the body a little more time to rev up the immune system to, get, to keep it away. And we can also make these CAR T cells not only out of the person's own cells, but if they've had the transplant, then they can make them out of the donor's T cells to kind of get them a little more skilled in doing what they're supposed to be doing. So what a CAR T cell is, is it's a normal lymphocyte and they've stuck a antigen receptor on there. They've stuck one of those proteins that recognizes those bad things out there. Chimeric, a chimera is a combination of things, to a combination of two things. <clears throat> An antigen is a protein on the cell surface and the receptor is where it locks in. I showed you that, that cell that had the, where the T cell and the cancer cell lock together. So they build CAR T cells. Very, it's, actually, it's actually easier than you think it would be. So what they do is they collect stem cells from the patient. They take out just the T cells. And of course, this is not mine. This is somebody else's. This, of course, it's the most important step. Then they take them to the, a lab. And what they do is they stick a virus in there. 
And this virus, the lentivirus, is called a retrovirus, and it's the kind of thing that Ebola is and HIV is, but this isn't carrying any kind of bad agent. It's just what it's doing is that it's carrying a gene into the cells that has the ability to make that protein that's going to stick out. They have to grow the cells, so they do it to a small handful of cells, and they have to grow them, then they give them back to the patient. This is another, it, this is a little more detailed than just that this is where they stick everything in. They actually, what they do is actually fascinating. They stick these magnetic beads on the cells and that's how they capture just the T cells that they want. Then they grow them and they got a lot more here. <clears throat> you guys are going to be seeing these people and it's, this is going to be the process of actually for just about everybody who's coming for CAR T cells. They're gonna come in, they do their screenings, they, they're checked out to make sure that they have adequate veins, do their h &P. They have to, like all clinical trials, they have to meet certain criteria. But you know, we try and weed these people out before they come. We don't want somebody to come and think that they're gonna get a treatment and it was our failure to screen them in the first place. And we want them to be able to go through with this. They all have to have lines eventually in there and it's very quickly they collect their stem cells it takes time to grow, but it's, they're ready in a week to 10 days, and they get their consent signed, and then they go forward. They do get some chemotherapy. It's not a lot, but they do get some, and the reason they have to do that is because their own immune system will kill off these foreign cells that have come in. Immune system's that smart to do it. So they give, they give some pretty much, it's the same, actually, the same conditioning they give for mini transplants without the radiation. They do fine with it. It's, people don't, they don't lose their counts or anything. And then they get their T cells and we watch them. Not much happens initially. And then, but then within the week, they start getting white, low white count. They start needing blood products. They need platelet transfusions and they replace the cells. And the really big thing that can happen with these people is that they have a lot of, um, cancer cells in them is they can get what's called tumor lysis syndrome. And you guys may have heard this someplace before, but what happens is that about three weeks after they get to T cells, all of a sudden all the tumor cells explode and all those proteins go out into the bloodstream and they clog the kidneys and they lower the blood pressure. It makes you really, really, really sick. And then there's another thing called the cytokine release syndrome that happened, can happen about the same time. And the difference between these two is this starts with a really, really, really high fever and they get admitted immediately to the hospital. And the big thing about this T cell, CAR T cell thing, thing <clears throat> treatment that's very different than all the other kind of chemotherapies that we get is they get this severe neurological problem. People can start losing their ability to speak. And some people have actually died from neurological brain deaths. They don't understand the process but it's one of the big risks of CAR T cells. And if the big thing is you have more tumor, the more likely it is to occur. But you have to realize these people are at the end. I mean, this, they're doing this because they're, all other treatments have failed. And the big thing about this is they get rid of those normal B cells. It binds to those normal B cells. That's part of how this whole system works because the B cells are the abnormal cells in, in these kind of, this kind of ALL and that kind of lymphoma. It's the B cell that has gone bad and all B cells are destroyed and they have to have lifelong treatment with immune globulin to prevent bacterial infections. So nothing is ever, there's no free ride. One of the doctors at Children's Hospital mm -hmm. just passed away and I was reading an article about um, B cell uh, treatment that he got, CAR cell. The uh, CAR T. I think, but yeah, I, I think he took away because of that. Yeah, because of that. Yeah, <coughs> it's, it's really it's once it starts, it's like a runaway train. But good care, most people get through it. So you're going to see here in this summer. Look at the number of diseases we're going to be treating. This is amazing. This is going to be amazing. And then the big thing, this is why we have a new immune system, we have a new immune system, we have a new immunotherapy clinic because every treatment, all these different kinds of diseases are gonna have all kinds of different trials and they're gonna require all kinds of different uh, 
preparation for it. Most people are really busy up there, and it's a specialty. Immunotherapy is a specialty. We don't know what the side effects are going to be. That's what phase one trials are all about, is learning about what the side effects of these things are. There are a lot of drugs that up, uh, given at the SCCA have never been given first-time human trials. So they create, we have created a new immunotherapy clinic. The nurse responsible, her name is Anne, she has to read these protocols inside and out and make sure everybody on that team, there's about 15 nurses, knows what's going to happen. There's an entire unit dedicated to this, and they're all experienced RNs. They took the best of the best of the best EMT nurses in the infusion room to do this. And this is the new clinic. If you guys are up in the clinic, go take a peek. That's just one of the rooms. All the care is done in the room. So this is different from the rest of the clinics if you haven't been there. They come in, they check in, blood draw comes to them, the nurse comes to them, the doctor comes to them, social work comes to them. They don't go anywhere else in the clinic unless they want some food, but even then they can order it up from the uh, bistro. This is one of the long hallways here. It's really, <laughs> Jeff Bezos, head of Amazon, gave us $20 million for this, and you might have heard he gave us $35 million. Not specifically, I have to tell you, not specifically for this unit. Um, it was given for general research, but they named it after him it, to honor to honor his family's involvement in cancer research. Here, these are all in the um, slide. If you want to look up anything else, the clinical trials, and there you go. It's complex. It's uh, very exciting. I think it's going to revolutionize. Uh, immunotherapy is going to revolutionize cancer care, but uh, nobody here at our institution foresees cancer being cured in the next 10 years. We would like to see a lot more money applied to that, but cancer is a scourge and it affects everybody from birth to death. So, you know, young, I should say, young to old. But there you go. Do you guys have any questions? <laughs>